The laminar flow between flat plates uh, is very useful for teaching and examining because you can get solutions to the laminar flow field by hand um, and in most fluid flows this isn't possible. Um, why is this? It's because the partial differential equations which we normally have to solve reduce down to ordinary differential equations which are much easier to solve than partial differential equations. I want to start by explaining uh, why they reduce um, to ordinary differential equations from partial differential equations. Now this only happens for laminar flow. Um, if you were to have turbulent flow uh, between the flat plates, there'd be a very, very large number of solutions um, which you wouldn't be able to calculate by hand. So the first thing we have to do is assume laminar flow. And essentially that means that we think of layers of liquid or fluid um, moving over each other and uh, moving only in the vx direction, um, so only in the x direction which I'll define parallel to the plates and the y direction I'll define perpendicular to the plates. So there's no velocity in the y direction, vy is equal to zero. Now this has consequences for the velocity in the x direction. I'll start by explaining it physically. Uh, if we go back to our little diagram and think of all the motion as being um, in the x direction, in other words there's no motion in the direction going up or down. It means that if fluid starts at this point here it, and travels only in the right-hand direction, then all the fluid in this streamline has to, or between these two streamlines, has to be moving through here uh, later on. And that means essentially that the velocity in the x direction must be constant. Now we can show that actually uh, using um, the conservation of mass for an incompressible fluid, which reduces to divergence of V is equal to zero. If we write this out in Cartesian coordinates, we get dVx by dx plus dVy by dy is equal to zero. But we know that because Vy is equal to zero, this term here is equal to zero, and therefore this reduces to dVx by dx is equal to zero. In other words, Vx is it constant. Now you should note that this doesn't tell us anything about the variation of Vx in the y direction. Um, dVx by dy, we have no information yet. And in general, that's not necessarily constant. So our general velocity field is V, it's a function of x, y, and t, uh, but we know it's a steady flow so that uh, the velocity field is not a function of t, time. Furthermore, we know that, uh, well, we know that vy is equal to zero, so there's no dependence of vy in either the x or the y directions. Secondly, we know that dv by dx is equal to zero, uh, so there's no dependence of v at all in the x direction, uh, because v y is equal to zero and dvx by dx is equal to zero. So there's no function of x um, in velocity vector. This means that the velocity vector v is a function of y only. Now this has a very important consequence for this partial derivative here, because um, dvx by dy is partials, is equivalent, therefore, or can be written as dvx by dy as an ordinary derivative. Now, there's something quite important to point out here. Uh, we're not saying that vx is held by a particle. It's still a field. We're simply saying that this field is only a function of y. And it's this little trick that allows us to convert our partial differential equations into ordinary differential equations. Now this is the formal expression for tor, the shear stress, um, but it can be simplified straight away because vy is equal to zero, so this whole term here is equal to zero. Um, and now let, let us look at tor and see whether it's a function of x and y or just a function of y. Well, because vx is just a function of y, uh, dvx by dy can only be a function of y, and therefore tor is only a function of y. In other words, if we, if we get any 
dtor by dy terms, they can also become ordinary derivatives dtor by dy. Once again, tor remains a field quantity, not held by a particle, it's held by the field, but because that field is only a function of y, we can convert the partial derivative to an ordinary derivative. Now let's think about the pressure field, and we'll start by considering a little element of fluid. It doesn't really matter what shape, but this is probably the easiest one to look at. A um, little element of fluid, and it has on each end of it, um, acting in the vertical direction, uh, it has the shear stresses, tor, and tor plus d tor by dx, moving in the x direction here, times delta x. Um, those are the shear forces acting in the vertical direction, and the pressure forces acting in the vertical direction are p down here, and p plus dp by dx, uh, dy, sorry, delta y. Now we know that d tau by dx is equal to zero from the argument above, so this and this cancel out. Uh, so let's rub them out. And then we also know that these this little fluid element is moving in an exactly horizontal line. It's not going up or down because we know that Vy is equal to zero, so that Vx uh, is the only component of velocity. Now what does this tell us about the pressure field? Well, let's think back to our equation of screenline curvature. If the pressure at the top was different from the pressure underneath, then the streamline would bend. But it's not, it's going straight. Therefore, the two pressures must be equivalent, and we can tell straight away that dp by dy is equal to zero. Now note this doesn't tell us anything about dp by dx, so in general, dp by dx does not have to be equal to zero, although it could be if it wanted to be. Um, but what we find here is that p, which is normally a function of x and y and time, uh, reduces to being p as a function of x only. It's not a function of y, it's not a function of time because we're in a steady flow. And this means that anything involving dp by dx uh, as a partial derivative becomes dp by dx as an ordinary derivative. Once again, the pressure, it's still a field, but because the field only depends on x, we can turn the partial derivative dp by dx into the ordinary derivative dp by dx. So now let's look at a control volume sandwiched between the two plates. Um, the control volume has little length delta x uh, in the horizontal direction and a little height delta y in the vertical direction. And I'm going to draw it over on the right, uh, expanded. Um, let's think about the forces in the x direction. Um, first of all, there'll be a pressure force on one side, pushing it in that direction, and that'll be counterbalanced by another pressure force on the other side, which will be of size P plus dP by dx. I'm continuing to write it as partial here, uh, just to emphasize the fact that normally it would be a partial derivative, uh, multiplied by delta x, which is the distance in the x direction. Um, the shear stresses, there'll be a shear stress from the layer of fluid underneath, which will be tor, and a shear stress from the layer of fluid on top, which will be tor plus d tor by dy times delta y. Now we know already that vx is constant. What does this mean for the forces in the x direction? Well, it means there's no acceleration in the x direction, which implies that there's no net force in the x direction. In other words, the forces around the control volume must balance out. So let's look at the net forces on the control volume. Now, looking at forces uh, going to the right, uh, sorry, looking at the shear stress first, um, and taking positive the forces that are pushing to the right in the positive x direction, uh, we have to start with a shear stress tor plus d tor by dy delta y. Um, and then looking at the force pushing to the left, we've got a minus tau, tor, sorry. Uh, that all acts over an area, delta x. And now looking at the pressures, we have a plus a p pushing to the right, minus p 
plus dp by dx delta x. That's all in brackets. And that acts over a distance uh, delta y. And they must sum to 0. So cancelling out and dividing through by delta x delta y will give us d tor by dy minus dp by dx is equal to 0. Now the next thing we're going to do is to note that uh, our definition um, of viscosity actually is that tau tor is equal to mu dvx by dy um, taking vy to be equal to 0. So we substitute that in here to get d by dy of mu dvx by dy minus dp by dx is equal to 0. And now what do we have here? This is quite interesting. Something that's going to relate vx to the pressure field. Now, if and only if the viscosity here is not a function of y, we can take it outside this uh, differential to become mu d2vx divided by dy squared on the left hand side is equal to dp by dx. Now I've kept this all as partial derivatives for now, but of course we've seen already that these can all be written as ordinary derivatives simply because these fields are not varying in the other directions. So we get an ordinary differential equation now d2vx by dy squared is equal to dp by dx. So whereas the top one was a partial differential equation, which would normally be difficult to solve, um, because p is not a function of y, and because vx is not a function of x, this can become a second order ordinary differential equation, which is much easier to solve. Now in Couet flow, which is the flow uh, between two plates with one of them moving um, but with no pressure gradient in the x direction we have dp by dx is equal to zero so we get d2 vx by dy squared is equal to zero that's a second order ordinary differential equation we're going to need two boundary conditions and they are that vx is equal to zero at y equals zero so at the bottom plate there's no velocity in the x direction by the no slip condition and that vx is equal to v big v at y equals h where h is the distance between the plates and v is the velocity of the top plate now we can solve this it's extremely easy to solve you can probably write down the solution straight away but let me do it a little bit more slowly uh, we're going to get first of all that dvx by dy is equal to some constant call it a uh, and then we're going to, in the next step, we're going to get, uh, you can put the indefinite integral dvx equals the indefinite integral a dy, and you can see simply that's going to give us vx is equal to a y plus b. And when you put in these boundary conditions, uh, you'll get that vx is equal to big V over h times y. In Poisson flow, on the other hand, uh, there is a pressure gradient. You've got a high pressure here, and a low pressure here. Um, Poisson flow is actually more relevant physically. You tend to find it more often, particularly in laminar flow in pipes. Uh, and when you solve a second order differential equation, this one here, you end up with a parabola for the velocity profile. And so drawing in velocity vectors here, the flow looks something like that. And I'll leave that up to you to do by yourselves.